All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Failing. I'm the new business development director for Lucas Diesel Systems. And as, um, as uh, part of the, uh, the Lucas Group, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this. Uh, I believe that is, this is the 12th uh, webinar that Tony's doing for us here in 2023. So welcome, everyone. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items for those of you who um, uh, have not muted yourself. We've muted everyone so that uh, we try and reduce the uh, dis distractions there. Uh, as as like to let everyone know that um, the uh, webinar is being recorded. So therefore, uh, in a day or so, we will have the recording available on the Lucas Diesel Systems YouTube channel. And Tony also has the um, webinar available on his uh, on his uh, website. Uh, we also will uh, reserve a little bit of space at the uh, end of the webinar for those of you who have some questions. Uh, if you'd like to please put them in the uh, Q&A section at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on how your screen is set up, and then we'll get uh, available. We'll get to those questions as soon as the uh, webinar finishes. The good news also is that for 2024, starting next year, we will have another 12 webinars uh, with Tony Salas. So we're very much looking forward to that. And thank you, Tony, for agreeing to that. We very much appreciate that. I know I think everyone uh, really appreciates all the great information that you give. And speaking about information, uh, before we get started, I'd just like to give you a little bit of information with regards to common rail. As Tony will be talking about common rail uh, today, we'd just like to review a few of the items that we have available. And I say a few, we have a lot of um, items available for uh, repairing or remanning common rail injectors. So as you can see here, the, the fine uh, print at the bottom, there's a lot of information on there as to all the uh, different individual components that we have available for remanning or as say for, for repairing common rail injectors. So if you're interested in any of these items, I'll give you our contact information just here in a few seconds. But we not only have all of the components available for remanning the uh, common rail injectors, the good news just announced, this is hot off the presses, we will have all of the shims available for calibrating the common rail injectors as well. And not only have all the shims available, you can customize the shims that you need. If you've been experienced already in uh, repairing these injectors, you know how many shims you need of what type, what sizes and so forth. You can customize this box. And then the even better news is if you run out of shims, you don't have to buy a whole entire box. You can buy the individual shims to put in those little spaces available and those of your fast moving shims. So uh, we'll have all that available as well. Uh, in addition, we also have available all the parts for repairing the pump, the high pressure pump. As you can see here, they have the plungers, the cams, uh, all of the seals and O-rings and so forth. We have all of those components available as well. And last but not least, we, at least we have uh, test equipment for testing the common rail injectors, as well as the specialized tools necessary for uh, repairing the injectors. So here we have an example of a, a single cylinder test bench, but we also have multi-cylinder test benches available. And as I say, we have the tools for measuring, uh, for assembly and so forth. So if you're interested in any of this uh, equipment, uh, you can contact either Erica and her information is available there on the left-hand side or myself and either one of us can help you out um, and uh, be able to, to point you in the right direction with regards to your needs. In addition, uh, we'll have a lot of this information and the parts available so we can show you at the uh, HDAW show, which is coming up in, I don't know, about three weeks time. Our booth number, as you can see there, pretty easy to remember, one, two, three, nine, 1239. So we invite you to stop by our booth at uh, HDAW and uh, for you to see all the new uh, items that we have available. Okay, without further ado, our presenter today, as I said a little earlier on, is Tony Salas. Tony is a veteran um, technician and instructor, and he has his um, uh, shop in uh, Las Vegas. 
and uh, he has been uh, teaching as well as repairing systems for the last 40 or so years. So Tony has a tremendous amount of uh, uh, experience. So without further ado, uh, Tony's uh, presentation today is entitled Common Rail Fuel Systems, Effects of Fuel and Additives. So Tony, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, pass it on to you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Mr. David Failing. I appreciate your help and always Lucas sponsoring. And like he mentioned, you guys are going to have to listen to me for another 12 months. Hopefully these webinars have been helpful throughout the year. And always let David and or myself or Erica know if you have any subjects that you'd like me to talk about. And uh, we'd be more than happy to plan ahead for 2024. Well, today's December 19th. Those of you watching live, appreciate you for being here. Those of you watching the recording, well, you missed the live one. No, I'm kidding. Uh, any comments or questions, please uh, go ahead and ask as you so please. The topic of the day is diesel common rail and fuel additives. And in this case, um, common rail. You know, let's get right to it. You know, I'll talk a little bit. I'll make a pause here. But common rail, as you know, pretty much what in diesel does not have common rail anymore. We see pretty much common rail dominate uh, every pretty much every diesel platform uh, from small little diesels to big diesels. Common rail seems to be here already, especially for better fuel economy, obviously power and to meet those lovely emissions, especially that suit accumulation and other suit and also NOx. So in this case, we see Denzel Bosch, Siemens, and also on the equipment side, we see John Deere, Delphi, and others as well. But in this case, common rail is common rail. You know, it all depends who designed it, but we typically have a high pressure pump. We got a low pressure feed, something where the fuel goes from the tank to the pump and all the way to the high pressure side where it's finally injected by that oh so mighty common rail injector. You know, as those of you that know my background, you know, it started off with GM with Duramax. My first diesel I ever had to learn was the 6.5. What a way to start. But anyways, went on to the Duramax and then I went off to Ford and then I took on the Ram. So in this case, the common rail has been a learning experience. So if you had taught or had gotten any training from me from back the days of 2001, 2002, we have learned our lessons through time. And what I mean by that is, you know, our test procedures and issues and you know the life that we have had to learn about common rail and shortcuts and stuff to help diagnose have been enhanced through the years so have i been teaching the same way as i taught back as i was in 2001 and 2003 and by the way david thank you for those 40 years but i can't hide it with all that gray hair when i step black hair but anyways the bottom line is yes common rail has gone through a lot of changes but the scrutinizing of the common rail you know, if we've been watching the L5Ps, you know, the L, I would say the bulk of my phone calls, you know, have been L5Ps. You know, Duramax L5Ps have been the bulk of it because the system is really scrutinizing the performance of that injector. Well, with us, we've been discussing in the past about injector quantity and injector timing codes that can be set. And it's not just something that you just replaced an injector. You know, we go back to the 6.0, you know, where we had that. The, also that Siemens injector that actually was the G5 injector that the G2, excuse me, the G2 injector where we had, you know, electrohydraulic control. Some people call it Huey. They say you're not supposed to call it Huey, but no matter what, fuel was a player with that along with engine oil. So as we move away from Huey and get to injector, it all comes down to also the maintenance. So let me put it to this way. My, I got some good friends and I got these reps that I deal as I travel from place to place and do training. And when you hear common rail systems like an LML Duramax that has over, you know, 400,000 to 500,000 miles. And they still are running the original injectors and the original CP4 pump. That's something that, you know, some of us are like, wow, that's unheard of. While you hear some trucks that may go 80 to 100,000 miles, depending on hours too. Yes, I get it. But in this case, that don't go a long time. So therefore, you know, I have had one customer that years ago that I bumped into him last year, actually. I bumped into him last year. It's an old story. But what it is is that we did his uh, LMM injectors on his Duramax and uh, hadn't seen him. But we had recommended a maintenance schedule plus additives to use and uh, just bumped into him, like I said, about a year ago. 
and he has over 600,000 miles on those sets of injectors that we sold him because I, I told him, well, who did your injectors this time around, right? And in this case, you know, it kind of was remarkable that he has now gotten over 400,000 miles on those pumps and those injectors. So in this case, that's where when I talk about CP4 pumps and the issues and when I talk about CP3s and I talk about the Siemens pump and so on, and I make these, you know, I've kind of put myself, my reputation on the line of what I see and what I, you know, I, I travel, those of you that know I travel from place to place that, hey, there is a way to make these systems live a long time, you know, and there, there's my favorite additives, I'm not going to lie to you, but there are others that I get asked to use and so on. And those that have sent me additives, I'm sorry, I've been trying to get to everybody, but I've been slammed to as well. But the bottom line is, you know, the life of a common rail depends not only on the maintenance, but also on the fuel quality and what's in the fuel, you know. So therefore, it is very important to understand that. Now, before some of you, I know some of you are really good with fuel additives that are out there. I saw some names. And in this case, I know you're really good fuel additives. I'm not claiming to be a chemist. By all means, I'm not. But what we do talk about is what we see out in the trade. Because I've always evaluated my performance based on you know, what is happening with the truck. In other words, we did this, we did this, we did that. How is it working out there on the truck? Is it lasting a long time? Like I just said, we have proven that already. So I don't take it lightly. Believe me, I don't take it lightly. So, but let's talk about the common rail and diesel fuel. So before I get into the diesel fuel itself, right? You know, you got low sulfur diesel, okay? We got the red stuff too. And I'm going to show you some manufacturers like General Motors view on that and so on. But there's the low sulfur diesel, which was the 500 parts per mil. And we saw what that happened there. We see other countries still use 500 parts per million. While here in the United States and Canada, we tend to see the ultra low sulfur diesel. So what is the difference between the red dyed fuel and the ultra low sulfur that we buy our traditional fuel stations? It's pretty much one's dyed, one's not dyed, but there's still 15 parts per million. But then as we're in winter time right now, it is December right now, and we are dealing with those areas that get that stuff called snow, right? And in this case, you start getting into the gelling issues. So therefore, in other words, diesel fuel needs help to work in cold weather. But at the same time, what about when it gets hot? Do we have issues there? So we do have our summer blends and our winter blends, that could be said. But no matter what, you know, we need to understand that us as technicians only see diesel fuel in probably two ways the ultra low, in other words, the parts per million of sulfur content, and also the cetane values or the cetane index, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So the one thing that one rep told me that I never thought about, he says, hey, Tony, did you know that, you know, what is the maximum, you know, allowable sulfur content in diesel? And you're like, well, you know, it's 15 parts per million, right? And he says, yeah, but what's the minimum? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, there's, and, and turns out after doing some research here in the state of Nevada, where I'm at, you know, was there is no minimum, you know, there is no minimum. So therefore, some of us associate sulfur with a lubricant, right? So, you know, we could talk about that. And then if you've been following uh, my, a guy that I know, his name is Mr. Kohlberg, that talks about the oxidation or the air that's in fuel that affects also the lubricity. And he's tried to get a good handle on or try to describe to us has has lubricity really been defined you know so you can talk to him about that I've, I've read his articles i've done his stuff but in this case he does come up with a good valid point but uh, we'll talk about that later too as well but no matter what you know we have had effects of diesel fuel on common rail itself so before we get into the nitty-gritty of, of the fuel you know like i said earlier the l5p has been the biggest headache because of the fact that it's now emission based. In the past, when I you know first was teaching Duramax, we talked about balancing rates, you know, plus or minus three cubic millimeters in park and then plus or minus six cubic millimeters in, you know, in drive. So we could see pretty much the fuel trim, meaning that are we commanding too much fuel or too little fuel, right? But in this case, when I have done servicing of common rails in the past when we've done injectors and who knows how many sets of injectors we have done or servicing of injectors has been the fact that we always find what well when i teach common rail the first thing in my diesel master course i teach is what is the number one enemy of common rail? and that would be what contamination right so in this case contamination is the biggest issue so if you've taken apart rails you've taken apart injectors and if you're like me i tend to play with cores 
I'll take stuff apart. I experiment. Like, I'm like that little kid that takes stuff apart. And it's amazing the junk that we find. For example, I just recently was showing another tech, you know, the common rail injector on a the piezos on Bosch. We took that apart. My God, that thing was loaded with junk and crap. All because, again, lack of maintenance and not to mention perhaps the fuel quality. So the bottom line is, you know, not only is the diesel fuel and whatever additive packages in it is affecting, you know, the uh, performance of the injector, but now it's causing emission related faults, right? If you've seen other YouTube videos, for example, they talk about pretty much the design of the cylinder itself, along with the piston itself, and also the spray design that they do, six, seven, or what eight hole spray that they're using. And in this case, all to reduce the pseudo that's being you know generated. But the thing is, I'm like, you're under the assumption that we are working with a good quality diesel fuel. Now, let me just throw for you guys or text. I don't like to complicate stuff, right? I could go from here in Las Vegas where I'm at, and I could drive to California, and I will get on my 6 diesel, I'm lucky if I get, I'm always trying to hit 20 miles per gallon, not loaded, obviously. And I'm. And by the way, that's not bad running on 35s. I'm getting about 19 to 20. And I'll get 19 to 20. You know, I'll cruise at 70, 75, she'll get me that much mileage. The funny thing is, when I fill up in, in Southern California and I come back home to Las Vegas, I'm lucky sometimes if I get 15 to 16. So therefore, you know, there are differences in... In other words, the cetane values or what else is going on in the fuel can affect. So from when we judge a common rails performance, you know, it's all depending on not only on the fuel quality, not only on the injectors, but let's not forget something about the programming. So, and yes, I know about that too. So the programming of the vehicle. Now, everybody thinks that there is a performance tuner that does it. And guys, I'll be honest with you, you guys can comment on it if you want, but I got to tell you, have you seen a tuner that really improves fuel economy? I know a lot of guys not toner. It's a, it's a no-no. I know about the no-nos. Not supposed to use a tuner. But those of you that have seen it, because today, this morning, I got like two messages. Hey, Tony, I got this truck and this truck, and it's deleted and all this stuff. And I'm like, are you really getting better fuel economy? Now, the only one that I'll give you slack about is the 6.4 power stroke. Because, yeah, we do see differences at 6.4. But you know, the programming. Now let's stick to stock programming. In other words, factory programming. And what I mean by that is there is something called fuel system reset, fuel calibration reset. In other words, we are seeing that you can actually reset the learned values of injector quantity that's being injected, right? I've told you stories in the past in my webinars where I had a knock sensor, one performance code, where I just had to reset the fuel adaptive values, right? In other words, the fuel parameters or fuel resets, depending which manufacturer we talk about. So programming can also be affected from a factory standpoint, right? So therefore, what I'm trying to get at is there's too many factors right now that affect fuel economy and diesel fuel, cetane, or whatever is actually part of it too as well. And the reason why I say whatever is because I know some of you are going to try to nail me on stuff. I got to cover my butt here. So let me get back to where I started off with this site. Let's look at the L5P, for example. We've talked about the L5P with fuel quality uh, and fuel quantity codes, right? Or timing codes too as well. So you know, when we're looking at that, that is affecting pretty much the performance or the power contribution of that cylinder, which in turn affects emissions because we're overfueling and underfueling. And we mentioned before of the NOx sensor the, doing a role play or doing the job of an oxygen sensor, which is what it is, right? So therefore, again, there is so much involved when we look at the proper performance of the common rail system along with diesel fuel. So it, can I get bad diesel fuel? And the answer is yes. Now, one of the things I wanted to do, but I didn't get time to do for this presentation, and maybe I'll do it next month, is that I actually like to test fuel here in Las Vegas. I've done it several times. I've done it like twice this year only, but um, I was going to do it one more time here where I actually have baby jars and I take samples of fuel. And I go to here where I am on Losey Road. I actually go ahead and take samples of fuel from the local fuel stations, which are, the, you know, we got the Sinclairs, the Chevrons, the Flying Jays, and, you know, all the other ones that are, you know, providing that diesel fuel because this is Truck Central here in North Las Vegas. And the thing is, in the past, you know, we've just compared the color by looking at the diesel fuel itself. And it's amazing how that can be. You know, and I, like I've taught in my classes before, where we see that the fuel looks clear, it looks yellow, it looks puke green kind of stuff, you know. And sometimes we see little floaties 
something floating in a diesel fuel. But the interesting part in the past has been when we let those jars or those baby jars sit for one to two days and how you see separation taking place, right? So therefore, the next question I ask, you know, if you know Las Vegas, I'm in the Mojave Desert, right? And the next question we ask is, how does diesel fuel get to Las Vegas, right? Some people say it's trucked in. No, it's not. So therefore, I could get into that and that causes some controversy. But let's just say there's some, there's, there's got to be something that pipes it in here, okay? But the bottom line is it's known that the, several of the fuel suppliers here are using the same base fuel while the additive package is added. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is, you know, that's where we see the differences in fuel because there have been several times that I've done the baby jar test. And I've been doing this for like over eight to 10 years and that all the fuel's perfect. I mean, it's always been perfect, but then there have been times where it's just different. So it makes you wonder what's going on with the additive package they add to the base fuel. Regardless though, our job is to always test the fuel. Our number one enemy for fuel, like I'll talk about later on as I talk about testing, because we like to use, this is my favorite tool that I've had for years right here. And this favorite tool, and I'm sorry that I might be phasing it out, but my favorite tool here is our fuel hydrometer. Why? Because I'm not a lab, right? I can send out fuel for testing, but if I want to get a general idea on what's going on with fuel, specific gravity testing does a good job. So in this case, you can make an investment in that. Because the other side of it too as well is, if I put a set of injectors in it and I don't test that fuel, because I got to tell you, I've eaten the few injectors that I had to buy because nobody tested the fuel. And like I said before, I will never understand how you will install a new set of injectors, rails, maybe a decant, you know, those, the whole kit, right? You do everything and yet you won't A, drain the tank or B, you won't test the fuel or replace the fuel filter. You know, I don't understand that. How in the heck would you do injectors, rails, all that, all the whole fuel system of thousands of dollars and not A, replace the fuel filter and B, drain the fuel tank, right? So with that said, that's why we like to do specific gravity testing there. So therefore, that works very well. So, you know, there you go. So in this case, yeah, we're going to look at that. But overall, please understand that don't forget diesel fuel when you look at the performance of a common rail system and also the life of a fuel system. You look at number nine right there, take a look at number nine right there. Number nine is the FRPR number two, which I call the pressure control valve. And in this case, we always tell you to remove that when you're trying to diagnose contamination. On a power stroke six, seven, it's a lot easier, but in this case, you like to remove it. Why? Because we're looking for contamination there to see what's going on. But it isn't just about the injectors when it comes to the diesel fuel quality. If I look at number 10 right here, this is a, you're looking at an L5P, uh, this is an L5P uh, after treatment system, but number 10 is the indirect injector. But luckily the indirect injector on the L5P is actually filtered fuel. Okay, it's already filtered because it's on the low pressure side. While on an LML, as you can see here, an LML at number 14, that actually is your indirect injector and it's known to get clogged. Very seldom have I seen coils fail. They do fail. But in this case, the majority of those of you that have done these, correct me if I'm wrong, write it in the chat. Have we not seen uh, those indirect injectors get clogged? They just don't inject enough fuel. So therefore, it never reaches those regeneration temperatures because that's its purpose, right? So it isn't just about the high pressure common rail system not about the injection pumps. And now if you're dealing with an LML or other diesel application that has some type of dedicated injector, we see that clogging is the issue as well. So when I talk to current people here in Las Vegas or I go on the road and I talk to customers about this, everybody has their own you know, ideology of what this is. And in this case, it goes still go to the contamination of that fuel system. How dirty is it? So fuel filters, again, is the key here. And when you look at the plumbing of an LML, take a look at this LML. Oh my God, we got plumbing galore, right? And in this case, you know, when you're talking about contamination, we're pretty much talking about everything that is in this fuel system. I look at the rails, I look at the, the lines and so on, and not to mention the filters itself. Because back then, you know, when I was teaching common rail in the early days, like I mentioned early, you know, we, we did Duramax, you know, LB7, LOIs, we did the Cummins five nines, you know, and others. And in this case, you know, it was funny. We did not have the tradition of replacing the fuel rails. 
It wasn't until I was teaching a class in Lethbridge, Canada years ago where we actually pulled the rails off. They had a whole bunch of engines at this facility that I was at. And I'll never forget what we found in the fuel rails because, you know, I was so focused in the injectors and the injection pump and the return, but never really paid attention to the fuel rails themselves. So when you stuck a boroscope, and you're welcome to do it if you have not done it, we've stuck a boroscope into the inlet of those fuel rails. And what have we found? You know, we have found just pitting, oxidation, rust, if you will. We see all that and it's amazing. You're like, well, why would rust be growing in there and all that? But that's what happens. So it is funny as you look at kits nowadays, you know, you see that the rail is already included. So that has changed through the years. So in this case, we see that. Now, for those of you who don't know, when you look at this commenter right here on this 5.9 rail, you're going to notice like the Duramax is they have an orifice inside on one of the ends. You're going to see a small orifice. And we've now seen on some Duramaxes and also these where you have inadequate fuel delivery. You have the pressure, but you don't have enough fuel. And in this case, it's because that orifice inside of that you can't, um, that rail, excuse me, that orifice in the rail can also get clogged as well. But it's acting like a dampener. It dampens the pulsations from the injection pump itself. So that has changed through the years. But again, role playing the issue with contamination. And then when we get into the six fours, you know, you know, we've, we've seen the Siemens common rail pump. And to be honest with you, this pump ain't so shabby, but it's at the mercy of what is in the fuel. So one of the things we tell you to do is to do a contamination test. Ford, for the longest time, if you've ever taken a Power Stroke 6.4 class, they told you to get that little black plastic cup, right? And you're supposed to go ahead and take a sample of that fuel from one of the injectors, right? But in this case, you know, when you look at the design of this injector, you know, you're going to see that it's very prone. Now, I'm going to go, gonna come back to the slide here in a second, but let me go to the pump itself. So, you know, we, we've dealt with this issue where we had a, a lubricity issue. Some people want to say lubricity or I claim it's actually a contamination issue. Because when you look at the semen pump, which you see here on the right, we have seen this annulus pump. Okay, this annulus, I like to call it the annulus pump. This is a kind of a transfer pump that's inside of the injection pump. And in this case, what it does, as you can see here, fuel will come in here and it actually will be transferred over to the, oh God, I'm trying to remember, the, Tony, wake up, high pressure, low pressure, uh, this is the volume control valve, ooh, almost lost it, there you go, volume control valve, number two is number con volume control valve, which controls, again, the volume of fuel going to each individual plunger, and then at number four, we have our pressure control valve, right? So that's all housed right there on the injection pump for those of you who haven't had a 6.4 class. Again, that's our low pressure. The big fat one on the backside is our high pressure. So what was nice about the Siemens pump, sort of nice, is that it housed all these components internally on the pump from the volume control valve to the pressure control valve to the annulus pump on the inside. Now, here's what happens. If there is enough contamination inside the fuel, as you can see, this annulus pumps kind of, you can say, kind of scrapes or, or kind of scrapes along this housing. And if there is enough grit in there, what's going to happen is going to start shaving some of that metal off the housing. And that's where we get metal going into the system. But the system is pretty resilient because it can handle some metal in it, believe it or not. So when I've had trucks come in with six fours, you know, the, the problem has been the fact that we have a low volume on one cylinder. We have a weak cylinder usually. Yeah, sometimes it could be fuel rail pressure too high, right? We get that too as well. Obviously, you can get a real bad one, which has inadequate low rail pressure, right? So in this case, it could be that too as well. But if I have a truck that comes in and I'm looking at desire and actual rail pressure, they're right next to each other. Then I do a balance test. I see that that injector on number whatever cylinder is low, right? So we do a relative compression test to make sure that we have good compression. So we're good to go there. However, we do know we need to do a contamination test. So like I mentioned with the L5P and the 6.7 power stroke, we take that pressure control valve on the rails to check for contamination. What am I going to do here on the 6.4? Well, like I said earlier, we're going to go ahead and take a line off and therefore check for contamination. Now, so where does all that contamination come from? Well, where that contamination came from, or that metal, I shouldn't say contamination, it's most like metal, came from that annulus pump. 
But here's the funny thing for my poor customers that say, Tony, you know, I know you told me it needs an injection pump. We got to clean the whole system, put a whole new system in it. We're talking about four or $5,000, right? If not more. Well, the thing I said, well, we can try something. We can try a flush. You know, we can try to flush the system. So we'll go over down the frame of the truck. We'll get on the suction side of the lift pump there, which is the HF, HFCM or HFM. And in this case, what we do is we tap into the return. And what we do, we use a cleaner. I like to use the BG1. And in this case, it actually has a little filter. And I could cycle a cleaner and just run the truck literally with this cleaner mixed with diesel fuel. And it's just collecting it on this filter, on this attachment. So it's surprising the metal we get out. Why am I telling you this? Why do we do this? Because A, my poor customer didn't have the money. I mean, it's a big bill, four or $5,000. So I said, we can try this. So we're done. We go ahead and disconnect the line again. Yes, it's costing me lines because the lines are not reusable. I get it. But in this case, we go ahead and check for metal again. I got no metal. So that's telling me that we pretty much cleaned this out. But I look at him. I said, you're going to have to pay an extra bill here. He goes, what's that? I need to pull that fuel tank down and clean it up. Because if there's metal in there, contamination in there, we got to clean it. So after a flush, after two or three lines, and maybe we have one bad injector or maybe two sometimes, but yet I'm still generating fuel pressure. The truck still runs. We do that and clean the tank out. Guess what? We're able to save the system. All because of what? Excess contamination, which brought on the metal, which in turn, you know, started clogging stuff. So we cross our fingers. We run a flush again in a week or two. We tell him to come back. He does that. And we say he probably saved himself a good $3,000, right? So it's kind of Mickey Mouse-ish to some of you, but I'm very sensitive to that poor guy. says, dude, I need my truck. I don't have that much money. Hey, I'll do what I can, and I still can make some money in the process. We could save it. And you know what's funny? I would say out of the 9, 10 trucks, we've done this on six fours, right, when it comes to contamination and the metal. I would say that out of 9, 10 that we've done, 8 are still fine. So therefore, it does work, even though I know – that the transfer annulus pump is not working at optimum levels, but I'm I'm basing on the fact that that lift pump that on that HCM, HFCM is doing its job and doing what it's supposed to do. However, let me go back here. So what's the other thing? Well, the other thing is when this injector first came out, which is still being used by Ford, and I and I will challenge you which truck is using it. But in this case, we had this mushroom valve here. Right. And that mushroom valve was controlled by the piezo. And when I first saw this, I said, that's a haven for trash to collect right there. Right. That's a haven for trash to collect there. So here you can see over here where we're moving the mushroom valve right there. And that's in, in that housing. And I have this tool that actually allows me to remove this nut right here, which adjusts again the travel. There is an adjustment there on the travel of it, you know. But the point I'm trying to make is we're trying to clean that junk out. So Believe it or not, I've done it where I've actually counted the number of turns out and we're going to count the same number of turns back in because I'm trying to get to the center to clean out all that trash on that seat of that mushroom valve, right? I'm guilty of doing that and cleaning the nozzles. Why? Because again, I have mercy on my poor customer that doesn't have the money, but we'll try to clean this injector. And guess what? We have had good luck doing that. My fuel trims are pretty off sometimes, but I try to get her as close as possible on the adjustment. So I, you can say that as a backyard mechanic, if you want to call me that, which I'm not, but you know, you can call me doing, you know, what I'm doing that I can get these injectors to actually start operating normally. They're my favorite injector because why? I don't need a lot of specialty equipment to test them because, all right, call me, but I'm just saying, but skip what I said. Anyways, um, LF, LB7, ah, my LB7, I've been with LB7 for a long time. Same thing, you know, when we looked at the LB7, what was the main thing that happened there was actually, again, the lubricity factor, right? Bosch was having issues back in the day when I was playing, they couldn't believe because they were using this ball and seat style injector for the longest time, right? So we were telling you to remove from the CP3 pump the fuel rail pressure regulator to see if it was really filled with contamination, right? And in this case, it was, and some it's easy, some it's not easy. On a, on a Duramax, it's not easy. But on a 5.9 or 6.7 Cummins, it is easy to remove and inspect for contamination. So therefore, we were doing other ways of checking those. Because if you've ever done LB7 injectors, you take that line off, what do you always see on the inlet there? I'm almost 90% of all LB7s that I've done, you take that line off, what's always in the inlet, the trash and so on. So again, kind of tells you the contamination factor and everything that's going on.
I'll never understand when I work on, you know, those because north of here, Las Vegas, we have a lot of alfalfa fields, you know, a lot of farms, alfalfa. And in this case, how they get these tanks full of, you know, hay. I don't know how that happens. You'd be surprised what we find on fuel systems alone. But this guy is regulating that fuel rail pressure by controlling, again, the volume of fuel going towards the plungers, right, on the injection pump. So in this case, that's what's regulating. But again, it's at the mercy of contamination. And I take it you all know about this trick, right, real quick, that you want to see what is it, 30 to 34 percent of duty cycle on the FRPRs. They actually tell you if you have a high return, but that's another subject. Because when we talk about high returns, it all depends how these injectors are working, right? I'll come back to the ball and seat. But, you know, when you look at the Bosch, which is very popular for us in this crowd with the 6.7 and the Duramax, right? You know, on a Duramax, you know, LML, you know, we're using these piezo common rail injectors. And what's going on is injectors. And by the way, I welcome you to tear up a, a, a core if you ever have one, you know, take it apart, put it back together the best you can. But because they're going to tear it apart anyways when they rebuild it. And the thing is, it's like... When I first saw this picture of this injector back in early, you know, what was it, 2010, 2011, I'm like, oh, great. Look at all these orifices and passages. That's just a haven again for trash to collect. So when you talk to, you know, like, for example, I get phone calls from Mexico and stuff, and they tell me, you know, one of the things they're doing is they figured out how to service and clean up these injectors, right? Because, again, Bosch at this time does not offer remand, but some companies are doing remands on them. But the bottom line is you got to watch out on the contamination factor here. So that's all I'm just trying to get across. So does diesel fuel play a role in the life of common rail, right? Does it play? Are we agreed or not? It does play a role, right? So in this case, there's the contamination factor, there's the fuel filter maintenance factor. You know, I get it because it does affect, but diesel fuel, we have to have a good understanding of it, right? Now, before I even continue, you know, you have to always take a good sample of what's going on with the diesel fuel. Let's start it off there, you know. So don't take for granted that the diesel fuel fine. Mitch, my former great tech that I love so much, I'll never forget when he used to do a drivability analysis, he would always take the fuel cap off and he always smelled. And you know, you know how many trucks he caught, you know, he, he would come into the office and say, well, we got a problem. I go, damn, you already figured out some stuff. He only had a truck for five minutes while he's diagnosing it, right? He's doing his basics. And sure enough, what do we see? He takes the cap off, there's sugar. <laughs> That's the funny one, right? He had sugar there, right? But there are other ones that he just, uh, he, we used to call it the Mitch smell test. In other words, he could smell gasoline mixed with the diesel fuel. And as you know, we now have since, you know, 2011 or so, we've been having that beautiful SER systems, right? So with SER, what do we got going? Right, we got now people still to the day putting what into the diesel fuel, the death fluid. Right, so the death fluid is still going in there. That's why in the past, in previous presentations here with Lucas, I have told you to please get those test trips to test the diesel fuel for traces of death because we can see also delayed failure. I call it delayed failure, I meaning it's slowly, slowly, dully happening because of the crystallization of death fluid. Now, some of you have told me stories. Hey, I've heard it. I haven't had no luck with it where you say, well, we got as much death as we could. We ran diesel fuel and luckily the truck is okay. Well, you lucked out. But what about those that don't, right? So in this case, when we talk about diesel fuel, we now are faced with contamination with gasoline or, you know, most likely death fluid, especially with the newer trucks of 2011 or so or newer. So therefore, definitely diesel craft has had those Available if you haven't been to their website, Diesel Craft, I highly recommend them to test again the diesel fuel for contamination. Not to mention water as well. Water can be another problem child there too as well. So therefore, again, it does affect the life. Now, I'm not going to name the state where I teach this classes at, but I'm, I I go to this state. I won't name names, but they they get this fleet buys this biodiesel. And this biodiesel is so god-awfully bad. You know, they see issues with gelling. They see issues with contamination. And the problem is, you know, they're complaining about their high failure rate. And it has to do with the biodiesel they're using. So as you know, 5% to 10% might be desired. But I don't care about the percentage in reality. What I care, first of all, when you're looking at biodiesel is 
what is the, is it ASTM certified? In other words, is it certified biodiesel, right? So in this case, biodiesel. Now, years ago, I spent some time with a guy in Ohio. I spent a weekend with him where he was telling me how he does certified biodiesel at his, he had a little side business going. But in the long run with biodiesel, what was found out was that the cost to make certified biodiesel exceeded the cost of the conventional ultra low sulfur fuel. So those of you, and I told those that wanted to use a certified bio, quote me here correctly, certified biodiesel was uh, pretty much caring about the environment. So is certified bio pretty good? Yes, it is. You know, so it's kind of funny how that is. But I'll tell you this quick story. You know, we I had years ago, a guy come to the shop pushing his biodiesel. I knew that it wasn't great biodiesel because I knew he probably had the heavy glycerin French fry oil stuff in there. And if you know about glycerin and so on, you probably know about the solidification of it, especially when it gets cool, right? I call it the bacon grease effect, right? You let it sit in the pan, it gets hard. Well, the thing is, I had this guy that has a mobile mechanic service, and later on that same day, it was funny, you know, they couldn't get this truck to pass emissions. It's an old, I forgot, I want to say it's a Mack truck. It's, it's been a long story, but it was so funny. And he had failed emissions at the labs, right? And they couldn't get this truck to pass. Obviously, this truck had low compression, had turbo issues, had blow by galore. It had everything wrong with it. So, yeah, this thing was puking pretty good smoke. You know, the opacity levels were a little bit on the high side, right? And the, the thing is, they're like, Tony, we got it. We, you got any ideas? I go, oh, Jesus, I mean, this truck is dying. You know, it's, it still runs. It's still old workhorse, still runs. But then I started thinking, I go, you know, this guy showed up with his biodiesel. And what I heard kind of proved, I had talked to a few people. Make a long story short, we called this guy. We tried his, his diesel fuel on this truck. The funny thing is this truck is running. For those of you who have experienced this, that diesel fuel, that excuse me, those fumes, exhaust fumes smell like McDonald's. It was getting you hungry, McDonald's fries. I kid you not. It smelled like McDonald's fries. Guess what? Send them back to the lab station to get emission tested again because they were testing it for the opacity levels. And they're like, they wouldn't pass it because they wanted to know what we did to make this truck lower its opacity levels because it passed at that point. There's no way within 24 hours or six hours, whatever it was, that you guys got this thing and we're laughing because it was actually the biodiesel, right? So it kind of tells you the differences between, obviously I told them run it dry because this stuff is going to, you know, screw up the pumps and so on. So we run diesel fuel after you're done with it, you know? So, but yeah, that's, if you haven't seen that stuff happen, you know, I know that in the Pacific, uh, when I was teaching in Hawaii, they used the fish oil and so on with biodiesel. But in other words, there's a lot going on with diesel fuel. So when people take on a diesel vehicle right and like like i said before in previous presentations the diesel jeep owners and so on the cheap jerky wranglers and they want to use a diesel what they don't understand is when i compare gasoline with diesel fuel gasoline is more consistent wherever you buy it while diesel fuel is you know there's no consistency in it you know you're lucky what gets good so when i was asking google about diesel fuel and sulfur i decided to say you know i haven't used ai yet though but in this case, I asked Google, you know, what does diesel fuel contain? Why does diesel fuel contain sulfur? So diesel fuel contains sulfur, which derives from the original crude oil source and can still be, be present after refining. After combustion in the engine, the sulfur in the fuel forms particulates that are primary contributor to air pollution and the comes for harmful corrosion in the engine. I think you all agree what we see that because it is part of the refining process. But before we continue, ultra low sulfur fuel, when I showed you earlier on the previous slide, where we went from 500 parts per million down to 15 parts per million, right? In this case, we saw that, um, you know, it was a drastic change from 500 to 15. I mean, we saw a huge drastic reduction in sulfur, right? So why did we see that reduction in sulfur? And a lot of it has to do with catalysts too, you know? So therefore, do catalysts like, you know, Sulfur. So in this case, no, they don't. So therefore, another one of the reasons, not all, but one of the reasons why we see the use of that going there. So therefore, that's what we see going on. So there you go. Anyways, so as we move along here, yeah, we do see, see that there. So, but remember the exhaust aspect, you know, since the 1990s, you know, the EPA mandates have resulted in 99% reduction of sulfur content in diesel fuel. So the reduction is directly responsible for a de decrease in sulfur dioxide emissions alone. Now, 
those of you that are instructors, I should pause this because this is the third time that pisses me off that I've heard this crapola. There are teachers that I, and I, I can tell you from one, and I'm not, God, I hate to put teachers down. I don't want to do that. But in this case, let's get the story clear. There are people saying, because I walked into a presentation where the guy was running a 2013, you know, power stroke six, seven, he was running in the classroom with no ventilation. And I'm like, what's this guy doing? You could smell, you know, the smell from the exhaust. And the guys, I go, sir, why do you have this on? And in this case, he says, oh, I'm just trying to show with these after treatment systems that the air coming out of the exhaust is much cleaner than what you breathe. I'm like, I'm like, really? And this is like the third time I've had teachers do this, or I've heard technicians tell me, hey, Tony, my, this guy was doing it in class. I'm like, no, because what's one thing that we do have in the exhaust is what, like we just sold you, sulfur dioxide and other stuff too as well that, you know, I couldn't tell you that I could, I, could, I have notes on that, but so therefore, please note, this reduction is directly responsible for a decrease in sulfur dioxide emissions, which alone have been a major contributor to serious health and environmental issues. So yeah. So even though the government is going after NOx levels and particulates, right, there is still other contaminants there in the exhaust, which are not exactly good for your lungs, you know? So health concerns related to sulfur dioxide exposure include respiratory problems and lung damage, tree, plant, stone, and damage, acid rain, and all that good stuff there that does happen. So that's from AXI International that I got that from, yeah. So lubricity, right? Removing sulfur contents from diesel fuel has been known, again, to alter the lubricity, right? Now, I know if I had, you know, uh, Mr. Colburn here, he'd be telling me about the oxidation. Hey, I respect that. But refineries use severe hydrotreating to remove sulfur. So this is a process that also happens to decrease diesel fuel natural lubricity, lower energy density, which oppresses your fuel economy, and increases overall production, right? So here's what happens, though. And I've already verified this. When I have a customer says, hey, I bought this brand because have you seen how many additives are sold out there? You know, there are so many additives sold out there. And I can't tell you how many people have given me some. I immediately turn away because I know it's junk. But there are so many additives. And I put myself in the position of my customer that, hey, I just got a diesel truck. This is my first diesel. You know, I'm going to be doing work with it. You know, what's the best you know, package to, to use. In other words, what should I be using, right? You just walk into the local auto parts, right? And in this case, just look at those aisles and look at all the different brands that they got, right? And in this case, you ask yourself, well, what, which one to use? Obviously, the gelling one you're going after in the wintertime, right? I need an anti-gel engine, right? But in this case, if you're looking for a good additive to use, you're going to look at costs, and you're going to look at, well, this guy says, or maybe you're you're looking at an inexperienced parts counter guy that just has a education of watching a few videos, and now he's selling parts, so he's pushing this additive, right? So in this case, you know, we just don't know. So there are some brands out there that uh, pretty much are well-known in our industry that are selling, you know, and there's some good stuff that's certified by manufacturers, right? So in this case... You know, my friends over at Diesel Services Group, they you know, they got their great additive pack, which is also recommended by PACCAR. You know, I've been a big BG guy, like I said earlier. We see Stan and I, we see a line part, we see a bunch of different people, you know, sell their different additives out there. So therefore, some of them have a reputation right there for being, you know, effective in the use because, you know, we I'm I'm gonna talk about the three different types that I feel of of additives we ought to be using that have worked for us. But in this case, please note that. I get customers that come in and say, hey, Tony, I bought the C10 Improver from So So brand, right? In this case, oh, that's great. He goes, yeah, man, I picked up two miles per gallon using this stuff. Immediately, that's a red flag. Because as, as I was told from an engineer, one of the quick ways to actually jack up the C10 rating, as they call it, but we'll get into C10 here in a little bit, has been to actually use heavy sulfur compounds, right? But the problem is, on the flip side of it, that's where we get our contamination or we get our catalyst poisoning as well. So therefore that's something to keep in mind as well. So there you go. But let, before I get too complicated, you know, let's talk about water, right? So in this case, water, you know, because we have our emulsifiers, what they call them. And in this case, they actually trap some of that water. We see our water separators in our fuel filters as well. But alone, ultra low sulfur deal has a higher affinity to water than traditional diesel. But before I, I forgot to put this on this slide, but another thing we got to keep in mind is, remember I was talking about biodiesel? 
Biodiesel is also what? Hydroscopic. It loves moisture. So that's another bad thing about biodiesel you got to be careful about, right? So water is going to be one of the main contributors to tank corrosion while also fostering rapid microbial growth in diesel, right? So the algae growth is known to be an indicator of water in fuel plus the sulfur content, right? So in this case, usually when we've seen a lot of microbial growth, which we mistaken for algae, you know, we actually, because I was doing it, and in this case, is because we probably have a low sulfur content in fuel. So in the past, we've done this little cheap method that if I see microbial growth, which we mistaken for algae, you know, it could be caused because of what? Low sulfur content in the fuel. So that's one of the indicators we've used in the shop bay, you know, to tell us what's going on with that fuel itself, not that great quality. Because again, it all goes back to that fuel quality and that fuel economy too. Don't forget that as we discussed there too, so... Now, but remember, when we look at the sulfur content, repeating, you know, 15 parts per million is the maximum. There is no minimum, right? Now, when you look at Canada, for example, and you look at Europe, many of those uh, countries have some type of lubricity standard. The United States does not have one. So in this case, we have issues. So that's what we see the problems with like the ball and seed erosion and other issues and pump lubricity as well. So therefore, that has a lot to do with it too as well. So, so therefore, the, the next thing is the algae growth in fuel can be an indicator of sulfur and content. But like I found from Diverse Energy page, I saw that algae requires sunlight for its growth. Because I told you that I mistakenly before that I said algae, no, it's actually a tank is closed and dark, so algae could, couldn't grow inside. Microbes, including mold, fungus, and bacteria, can get inside your diesel fuel tank and grow, creating a biomass, which is the technical term for the sludge that you might think is algae. Okay, so there you go. That's why good research does help on the internet. That's why I tell people, if you have one of these and you're stupid, it's because you want to be stupid. So therefore, that's why you can do a little reading. And I said, oh, here I was calling it algae. But in reality, it's what? The microbes, which are mold, fungal bacteria. And if, if you've ever seen, you know, you pull out an injector, you got this growth on it. It kind of looks eerie if you've never seen that in the past, which we don't see too much here on the West side. I've seen it mostly in Eastern United States, but not so much here in the Western U.S., but we do see it from time to time there. So therefore, there you go. Something to learn about right there. So. Therefore, as we continue on with the common rail and the fuel association between these two is, let me start from the bottom. I, I take it you guys have gotten it, right? Cleanliness, you know, fuel filter servicing, making sure the rails are capped and the injectors are capped when you're doing major service, such as a cylinder head gasket or engine replacement and so on. You know, you got to do that. Fuel atomization is essential for emission reduction and power enhancement. So what is the package that is in that diesel fuel? So common rail systems, again, have had different spray patterns. So one thing I show in my diesel master course is we tear down an injector, we get to the nozzle assembly, and we use the old spray candy. They're using car fuel or brake clean, and we just show the spray patterns, right? And that tells you a whole heck of a lot of what's going on. So when we take these injector nozzles off, it is surprising how they can get so clogged, right? And we'll put them in an ultrasonic cleaner just to show if we can clean them. And sometimes, guess what? They are so stuck shut, they're so plugged up, you know, there's nothing I can do. So therefore, that's why many have do or do replacement of the nozzles when they rebuild injectors, right? So when we were talking about the ball and seat injectors, those of you that never had training on this, because I know a lot of you have had, but some of you haven't. In this case, we talk about that ball and seat erosion right there. You know, that has been attributed to the lubricity issue. Right. In other words, fuel was the lubricity agent and Bosch in the early years did not have a problem with it in Europe. But then when they brought it on the Duramax, the first common rail to take it on on the light duty truck, boy, did we see a lot of ball and seat erosion. But here's the thing. We still see a lot of ball and seat erosion. Right. These injectors have been known not to go over 12 to 20,000 miles, but it begs again, what is going on with the fuel? OK, what is the fuel? So when we run our fuel additives that we recommend, you know, we have seen extended life on these LB7 injectors. When a guy looking at me, hey, Tony, I got 200,000 on my LB7 injectors. I'm like, wow, if you got it with just traditional diesel fuel, you got good diesel fuel in your area. But if you're not, it's because your diesel fuel has something to be desired, you know. 
So therefore, that attributes to life. But don't forget also, we got that nozzle, like I just said, also too as well, that is affected by it. So a lot going on with the injector, I get it. But in this case, again, the quality of the diesel fuel and the life of it. Now, when it comes to the old LB7 LOYs, LMMs, even the, uh, you know, the, what is it, the LML? You know, that fuel filter, I've always fought with, um, you know, Jim in the past when I worked for them. It's like, why do we insist on using one filter, right? I get it. It's a four micron filter, you know, and in this case, that four micron filter is doing a good job, but the surface area to remove all the water kind of desires. So when you compare that with, you know, like, for example, the 6.0 power stroke, the 6.0 has two filters, you know, a 10 micron and what is it, a four micron? And then you look at the 6.4, two filters as well. Even the newer Cummins six sevens have two filters. But, you know, GM, even on the new L5P, still insists on using one filter. So I kind of like the idea of two-stage filtering for the simple reason that we're just trying, again, to capture every contaminant that we can, especially when you break it down to four microns. It's pretty impressive at that point. Yes, I know that the aftermarket sells that big cat filter and Fast and AirDog and other companies sell you filtration systems that work very well. I get it. So, you know, it's an option too as well. But all I'm just trying to say is, yeah, that filter. You got one filter. You got so. All right. Let's, uh, where are we at here? How are we doing so far? Hopefully we're staying you awake there. So, all right. Uh, cetane. Let's talk about cetane. Diesel users often equate the cetane rating and diesel fuel with the octane rate of gasoline. Yeah, we do. Sometimes we compare that. Conceptually, that's not a bad comparison, but both of them can give you a general indication of the combustion qualities of the fuel. So you may hear a mechanic talk about adding cetane to the fuel. What they really mean is they want to add a chemical to the fuel that improves the fuel's performance on the cetane index. So therefore, the measurement scale that reflects the combustibility of the fuel. This is from Bell Performance here, and they're, what they're saying there is... You know, a better cetane rating in diesel fuel means that the fuel ignites faster in the cylinder. An important feature of better functional contrast. In contrast, better cetane rating gasoline means that gas ignites more slowly. Well, on a diesel, we want it quicker. Hmm. All right. So before I get, let me change my screens. I'm going to do a new share here. And we're going to go over to, first of all, let me tell you what we do before let's get a complex. One of my old worksheets that I should bring back actually in my courses, my Duramax course, even my other course, my diesel master courses, we actually have, again, once again, we do testing a few. I showed you earlier the hydrometer. And GM was one of the first manufacturers I dealt with, so therefore this was a good thing to actually test the fuel itself. So therefore, one of the things you were supposed to do is Take a sample of fuel, and at that point, you were going to go ahead and test the specific gravity. What was interesting, though, is, again, the values for, again, that you were given in the hydrometer. So in this case, you squeezed it. You compensated for any temperature there, right? And in this case, it says refer to the fuel-specific gravity table. If the correct fuel is being used in the conditions listed in fuel quality, it meets number one or number two. Right. We all know about number two. I didn't get into that yet. But in this case, the specific gravity for number two was 30 to 39. And number one was 39 to 44. So we were inferring by the specific gravity testing that, again, that we actually were pretty much where we're supposed to be on the cetane rating. However, though, I can tell you by the use of this guide through the years, actually, this is my second or third one. We broke the glass on a few of them. This one needs washing. But in this case, uh, I can't tell you, as soon as we take the sample, oh, my God, you could see the water immediately. So time and time and time again, we have seen excess moisture or water there, too, as well. So water has been a good telltale of what's going on. Again, I highly recommend, by the way, if you want a copy of this, uh, give me an email, and I'll be more than happy to give you a copy of this. But in this case, what I'm just trying to show here is again that uh, you know you can infer a preliminary cetane rating based on a specific gravity with the specific uh, use of a hydrometer. Now I'm going to change over here. Hopefully, let me know if it changed over. Should have changed over to uh, this GM document here that they're also talking about. So let me know if you got it because I'm hoping you did. Now, as I blow this up, it says here, even from GM, again, I'm giving you sources where you can learn more about fuel along with some great websites out there. But look at contaminants and fuel diagnosis. It tells you fungi and other microorganisms can survive and multiply in diesel fuel if water is present. So the fungi can be present many in part 
of the fuel handling system. So these fungi grow into long strings and will form into large globules, if I pronounce that correctly. The growths appear slimy and are usually black, green, or brown. The fungi may grow anywhere in the fuel, but are almost plentiful where diesel fuel and water meet. Service stations tanks may contain fungi that can be pumped into a vehicle during refueling. So it continues talking about that and the contamination. So that's why. As we go to the next paragraph, it says, if fungi have caused fuel system contamination, use a diesel fuel biocide to sterilize the fuel system. Do not exceed the dosage recommended on the label. I'll be honest with you. In the past, we haven't done that. We just empty the tank out. We're taking it all out, not to mention we're washing that tank. So luckily, I got a radiator shop that cleans our tanks for us, and they've done a great job of doing that. But again, a biocide is another offense. Off, off, off. <laughs> another Another option. There you go. That's the word I was trying to say. So in this case, that's what you're going to see there. So in this case, it continues talking about all the other contaminants there too as well. And it is acceptable, according to them, to use up to 20% biodiesel. So there you see some good information regarding what General Motors as a manufacturer is telling you about the quality of the diesel fuel and what to look out for. So, hey, look out for what's going on out there, right? So if I go to my uh, my service information right here, I also see another one from GM that I fished out that talks about, again, your, you know, your diesel fuel. Now, I'm not going to read this. You guys can uh, look it up. And if you want to copy this, I guess I can email it to you, too. But it's in your service info talking about, again, your diesel fuel quality and your grades that you're supposed to use. So, again, everything outlined here. So, definitely. And, you know, it tells you about cold weather and so on, what to look out for, like we said already. So, Again, all nice information for you to actually use. So therefore, you know, it does work very well. So in essence, let me go back to my PowerPoint here. Sorry. Um, in essence, what we're just trying to tell you is that you do have a lot of good information there for, you know, learning more about those qualities and those mission information that it wants for diesel fuel. So, all right. So we left off on cetane rating, right? So in this case, as we talk about that, right? You know, I highlighted some stuff here that came from the, from Bell Performance website. It says a fuel CTA number reflects its kind of performance in a standard ASTM test involving a certain kind of engine. So that's the CTA number, like you just saw from General Motors. CTA index, on the other hand, is a calculation that doesn't involve putting the fuel aside an engine. Rather, it's a calculation based on a fuel's density and its distillation curve, right? So think of the index as a predictor. Cetane improver additives don't affect cetane index, but they do raise the cetane number. And therefore, they have a tangible benefit for improving diesel fuel combustibility. Just keep in mind that if a cetane product talks about how it will raise performance on its fuel, cetane index is probably not legitimate, and you may want to pass that snake oil by, right? And boy, did I like that last night. Yes, it is. But again... You got to understand that, like I said before, a major C10 improver that's used on systems. That's that's why I say, you know, before I continue, when you look at some bottles of some additives, you're going to see, see that it clearly states, like a guy brought me one of Schaefer, and the Schaefer fuel additive clearly said safe to use on catalyst equipped vehicles, right? Now, all, not all of them have it because it wasn't mandated, but you got to watch out for those additives that actually have those issues going on there. So be careful about that. So. So, yeah, Percy, hey, Percy, nice to see you, buddy. Uh, the timing of new engines is much later. He's is exactly resulting in hydrocarbons, partial combustion fuel. Yes, C10 causes the fuel to burn quicker, reducing the hydrocarbon. Yes, and C10, and Percy, I ain't going to argue with you. You're right. That is correct. So, and by the way, make note of Percy. He's a great guy over at uh, Diesel Services Group there over in Saskatoon. Nice to see you, Percy. But in this case, yeah, that's something that he is correct since they also do their fuel additives as well. So, hopefully, he has agreed with me on what I've said. But in this case, yeah, be careful about those additives that are out there too as well. So, you know, as we're starting to finish up here, I'm a little bit early, but in this case, what you want to do as you're looking at the, you know, the common rail system is to test your fuel. I know that as a shop, I know you guys have, some of you have labs you send your fuel to, that, that's great. But as a general, you know, as a general indicator, hey, go ahead and mes measure your specific gravity. Mine has been used time and time and time again. And let me tell you, you want to take a look at that diesel fuel for the simple reason that if you're doing injectors and pumps and you're doing servicing, you better make sure that fuel, is, for, for starters, doesn't have excess water, 
you know you know when we go into like we have our monsoon season we get our rain season it isn't surprising how many truck fuel tanks aren't properly sealed and they get themselves loaded with water so in this case you know watch out for that so in this case what i'm trying to say is you know hey test your fuel even on the local basis take a look at it you know and if you want to do like i do my baby jar test it sounds primitive but guys it works to tell me what's going on with fuel and it's scary what we see sometimes just by visibly seeing the fuel itself now color should not be important you know if i see a clear to a light green you know blue green it's not so much the color but it's also not to mention what additive package they put in it so and you'll see it on the performance on the emission so so what's it come down to well uh, from my perspective, and Percy, if you want to jump in on this, I would appreciate your input too. And that is, is that what are those additives that you want to look for? Now, I'm not going to name names because, you know, this is a Lucas sponsored webinar, but you know, you know, Percy, they got their great additive. You'll see them on our diesel TG website. You know, I got the Statenine people. We got the other people there too that sell, like I told you, my BG, but you're looking for a good lubricant, right? So therefore something that aids. Now I know they come in packages. You know, you got this one additive that comes with the lubricant and a cetane improver as well. But the one that I'm still sticklers on that I have yet to be beaten has been my lovely BG245. And let me tell you why. It's because it's been a great cleaner. We have had customers come in with injectors that who knows what's wrong with them. This thing is just puking black smoke like you wouldn't believe. And we use this aggressive cleaner. And I've risked the life of the pump here because I'm putting a pretty aggressive cleaner to try to dissolve and clean some of these nozzles. And it's worked. It's worked very well. We have seen extended life by the use of this. But in this case, you know, it's because of all the contaminants that could be found in diesel fuel, even from your supplier where you buy it at the local fuel station. So cleaner to me has been very vital in the life of a common rail system. That's why we see these two, three, four hundred thousand miles. When I go to different distributors all over the country and they tell me about their additive that they're pushing, you know, they have great results too. Hey, I'm sure that, you know, BG or Standard Eye and all the other ones are not the only ones. There's some great ones out there. So therefore, you know, definitely want to use those. So, you know, definitely want to look at a good cleaner, a lubricant. And last but not least, yes, is the cetane improver. So therefore the cetane improver does aid because of the simple fact that what is the sulfur content in the fuel and other things that are improved, that actually affect your cetane. Again, I'm not a chemist. So therefore I'm just trying to tell you what you're looking for. But based on Tony's backyard mechanic mentality that's a little educated is the fact that we have seen good results of the common rail system by simply looking and getting some of these proper. And, uh, and Percy, since you're on there, if you want to post right there your product name there, you're welcome to because I think you guys are great too as well. I've been trying out your product, those samples you guys sent me. It's been very good too as well, and I appreciate them attending. But in this case, yeah, it does work very well. So in this case, you guys as a, as a professionals, you know, you need to understand that that's what you're looking for there when it comes to it. So, so can a common rail, in conclusion though, can a common rail system, last a long time the answer is definitely yes okay is definitely yes but in this case it requires again the maintenance and the proper fuel for it to work not to mention to reduce any issues there in other words what i'm trying to say is you're trying to reduce you know emission related issues and so on heavy particulates and so on because i got customers that buy their fuel from the local airports and they're using jet a jet b fuel two stroke oil Everybody has, has their backyard blends that they advertise on different websites and God help us. So therefore, you know, they're doing that. So, yeah. And here you can see post um, a post there from Percy where he actually is uh, talk about his four plus brand. So therefore he does great stuff too as well. Because I appreciate a manufacturer of an additive that makes a good quality product that does work. Not trying to sell you snake oil because I understand the consumer. I understand where he's coming from because he's like, what stuff did I use, Tony? You know, so that does help. Well, I'm a little bit early, Mr. David, but how did I do? You did very well, Tony. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't uh, downgrade yourself and call you a, a backyard mechanic because you've got so much experience and it's experience accounts because firsthand experience, you can have all the theory in the world, but firsthand experience is what counts. And that's what uh, solves your problems. And uh, you give us so much good information on these webinars 
you know, I listen to the webinar. I'm not, you know, firsthand. I don't, I don't work on vehicles for a living, but, uh, you know, it's super interesting to me, all the, the, the good pointers and all the great information you give. And this yeah, webinar, comes, here, if you don't mind me saying, but what it comes down to, unfortunately, with today's diesel fuel, yeah, is that you have to be using additives if you want the yes. life out of these systems. Yep, unfortunately, yep. that's a sad fact. <clears throat> you know, to get that life out of injectors, you got to be using additives. Unfortunately, yeah. sure. We we have one comment from uh, uh, an individual here. It says, "I call it green fuel in the southern states where it is hotter. I will find green stuff growing in the fuel tank." Clean it out. Clean out the shop one thousand dollar one thousand gallon tank, and the problem is solved. Add a biocide moving forward in the, the the source of the fuel. So that's another good point too. You really yeah, and like I mentioned before, it's just a headache when you deal with fleets. I deal with a lot of fleets. I train once in a while, and the thing is, like guys, I'm you know they're having these problems and they want to train on. It's not the common rail system. It's your fuel. You know, right, and we physically had taught their managers, but their managers are at the mercy of whoever is getting that cheap fuel. You know, it's like sure. So, just as a matter of interest, what do you do with the fuel? Say, for example, you say you drop the tank, you know, take the tank somewhere, have it cleaned out, put it back on again. What What do you do with the fuel that you just removed? Say, for example, you know, you remove ten gallons, twenty gallons from the the, the pickup truck. What do you do with that fuel? Most of our uh, oil collectors and hazardous waste, they actually take it. Okay. As a matter of fact, we just had some eight-year-old fuel we just got rid of. And luckily, our oil collector guy took it. So it's like Good. we had to fill up some paperwork. But yeah, he took yeah. it. So uh, luckily, it didn't break the bank. So yes. it was not too expensive. No, because in the past, when I've had contaminated diesel fuel, it was sure. a healthy three dollars $400 to, to, them yes. to take at least two to four gallons. But nowadays... I don't know what they're doing with it. I mean, I'm hoping they're doing it legitimately with it, but yeah. I was just happy to get rid of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I don't have too many other questions here. I think you you covered so much good information that there's really no no need for any questions because you covered it, basically all of it. I just wanted to thank you, Tony, very much for this uh, year's worth of 12 uh, great webinars. I mean, they're full of information. I think it's... Uh, it's a tremendous asset uh, to our industry. And as a, uh, a Lucas-sponsored uh, uh, webinar, we appreciate everyone who participates in this. Uh, I'd like to remind you once again, we'll be at uh, ADS slant HDAW and exhibiting at X HDAW. We'd love to see everyone there. Please come by our booth. We've got a lot of new product there to show you. So don't forget to come by and say hi and see what we have that's new. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy holidays and we look yeah. forward to seeing you in January again uh, with another one of Tony's uh, webinars. Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, Happy Holidays to you, too. You take care. Take care. Thank you. See you next year. Thank you.